Thank you all for coming. This is a spicy title, isn't it? Uh, at least the first one looks very exciting. I don't know how we feel about the second one, but we'll find out if that's interesting too. So my name is Sebastian Roll. Uh, I have a teeny tiny company that does consulting gigs. I do uh, hardware design. I like to play around with MicroPython. And until recently, I also uh, was a senior consultant at a medium to large size uh, consulting company in Norway. So the agenda for today is to explain what the principal agent theory problem is, uh, look at it in the context of software consulting. Uh, we're going to have a look at some sneaky things that a consulting company might do. Um, and we're going to have a look at mitigation strategies, what we can do about it. So let's start at the beginning. What does a consultant do? I'm sure you've seen one of those, maybe, at the office. We like to wear shirts. At least I wear a shirt uh, at the interview, and uh, maybe sometimes for the first day at work. And then I relax a little bit, and I start wearing my t-shirts again. So consultants are called in um, to gain some, some external, some ad objective advice uh, that you can't get uh, in-house, recommendations. Uh, a consultant might also be an expert at a field uh, where you're missing that competence in-house. Uh, but a consultant can also be a person that helps you out temporarily at a project that you have and you need extra hands. It can even be that part of your project or even the entire project itself uh, might be uh, handled by a consulting company. So th these are the four main uh, parts of being a consultant. And it's booming. It grows every year. Uh, technology and IT consulting can, comprises 20% of the global uh, consulting market. Um, recruiting is very high, especially in Norway, for consulting companies, and they pay well. Uh, it's exciting to be a consultant because you can uh, get to see many different technologies. You get to see how things are in many different companies, and you learn fast. Some businesses, they like the idea of having a consultant because then you can just get someone in for a specific purpose, and when they finish with their job, they leave. So you don't have to deal so much about retaining people, uh, laying people off when there's no need for them. So it's easier to get rid of us. But um, IT projects do not always fare well. So there was a study uh, in 2000. 15 from a Norwegian university called Success and Failure in Public IT Projects. And it had some damning stati statistics. So what they did that was that they found five metrics that they used. One is uh, use value of the deliverable, technical quality of the product, um, cost control in the project, time management, and lastly, efficiency uh, in the project execution. And they found out that only 8% of these projects succeeded uh, on all these success factors. Around 50% uh, were unsatisfactory in at least one of these factors. And also the largest projects seem to be overrepresented in the, in the cases where there are failures. Um, to bring up one example we had was uh, there was a project in Oslo, our capital, to, uh, to uh, have a unified electronic ticketing system for uh, our public transportation. So if there are any Django developers here, they would maybe say this. I think it'll take three weeks. Uh, it took 10 years. <laughs> and it cost around uh, 67 million euros. And it was a complete failure. Uh, what the report also interestingly found was that they found no significant difference between private and public IT projects. They all had uh, very similar uh, failure rates. Let's 
see. So what causes this? What makes a bad project? Um, why do we overspend and why do we underachieve? Why do we delay? Is it the client? Does the client not give good enough specifications? Is it the contractor? Do they not deliver high quality? Um, usually it's a bit of both. Usually it's one, usually it's the other. Usually, sometimes it's external factors that uh, you cannot foresee. Maybe a key person or some key personnel drops out of the project and you lose uh, important uh, experience. But for the purpose of this presentation, we're going to be focusing on the contractor, the consulting company. But to get closer to the nature of this problem, um, let's consider a more simple example. So your car breaks down, or your car starts making a noise, an annoying noise, and then there's a dashboard light that comes up, one of those dangerous uh, genie-in-a-bottle uh, lights, and you're worried. So what can you do? You can do one of two things. You can either decide, I'm going to learn about car repairs, I'm going to spend uh, a couple of months studying this, and I'm going to try to do it myself. For me, if I tried that, it would still be my first attempt trying to fix a car, so I would probably still fail. So what I would do is I would take it to a repair shop. And the repair guy, he comes, he looks uh, pleasant, he has a look at the problem, gives me a diagnosis, he gives me a price. But there are two important concepts that are at play here uh, in this interaction. And one is that the repair guy knows much more than I do about the domain. So the repair guy knows a lot about repairing cars, but I don't. So I don't have any good way to figure out if he's actually telling me the truth or not. Is he scamming me? Is he being reasonable? Um, is he a good repairman? Is he even a car repairman at all? Um, the second factor is there's a potential difference in interest here. So my interest is to get the car repaired as fast as possible. If you can work overtime, that's cool. Uh, if you can do it for free, that would be great. Uh, if not, then the lowest possible price. Whereas the repair, uh, car repair person, he wants to uh, get as high price as he can that would still make me uh, happy to pay the price. So there are slightly different incentive schemes here. So it turns out that economists and uh, people in political science, they define this type of uh, interaction uh, as a principal agent problem. A principal agent problem occurs when you, as a principal, you want something done, and you don't want to do it yourself, you want an agent to do it. Uh, maybe the agent is much better at doing that than you are. Um, this is from Wikipedia. Principal hires the agent. The agent performs work for the principal. There is asymmetric information there that comes in from the top. Um, so one is that I can't really know if he's a good repair, car repair man. I don't uh, know if what he's telling me is the truth. But I also don't really, I can't really control him. I can't really know uh, if he's doing what he should be doing. So that's asymmetric information. There is also the concept we talked about, different interests. You see the self-interest thing that goes there? So these two concepts combine to form a potential risk for the agent doing things that are contrary to the principal's interest. So the agent might do things that the principal don't want him, do not want him to do. And the result we call adverse selection. You might pick the wrong person for the job. And also moral hazard. Moral hazard is that thing where uh, the agent is wor working contrary to your interest as a principal. And this works on four fundamental assumptions. One is that principal and agent are rational actors. Uh, two, the action of the agent affects the success outcome of the principal. Uh, the principal cannot fully control the agent and there's a divergence of interest at play. And that causes the potential of adverse selection and moral hazard. 
Um, this concept is relevant to many different things. Um, it's, it can be described, an employer-employee relationship can be described in this way. Um, shareholder management, they might have different uh, incentives. Shareholder wants to maximize profit. Management maybe wants to keep his job and uh, have a more stable outlook for, his, for the company. So, asymmetric information. Um, many of you might already be looking at this and thinking, is this high quality code? Like, and uh, you might be able to determine that, but if you're not a coder, you're not gonna be able to determine that. You have no way of knowing if this is high quality. Uh, you can only ask, uh, does it work, maybe? But is does it work, is that a good enough uh, qualification for a good execution or for a good uh, product? Definitely it's not. Um, the different interests. You might want, I'm, I wanted a house. I wanted it to be built according to specification. I gave them dimensions and everything, and this is what they gave me. They minimized their own cost to, uh, to hand in a, a product that's according to the specifications. Now, what I'm gonna do in my research here, I found uh, a publication called Principal Agent Theory and its Application to Analyze Outsourcing of Software Development. And we're talking about like, how does this principal agent problem apply to software consulting? And it says, I quote, the problem is especially glaring for the software business due to missing metrics and measures for programmers' productivity and software quality. The missing concreteness of software makes it harder to control effort invested and results reached. So I would say definitely that software consulting is, uh, uh, has the potential of asymmetric information, for sure. And there's also a diverging interest. So um, let's play a game. I know there are some hackers uh, in the audience, maybe some pen testers. So we're going to have fun and figure out which exploits can we find if we're a nefarious agent. How can we maximize our own gains according to our interests? So what we can do, we can do the bait and switch. So you get the top guy in your company, really good guy, he uh, has awesome CV, he's very good at writing proposals kind of implicate that he's going to be part of the project. Uh, you use uh, the brand that you have. You're a big company, maybe. Uh, you're recognized. And then when you get the contract, you kind of change the terms. Uh, all of a sudden, this guy, awesome star guy, he's out of the project and replaced by 10 uh, junior developers who are, form or are just recent graduates. We slap some uh, certification on these junior graduates uh, so they have uh, some, at least something on his, their CV. Um, and the junior devs, they make more mistakes too. So that means that uh, there's more work to be done. There's more bugs to be fixed. And that's also good for uh, when the product is delivered and you want maintenance. So um, one thing to say about that is that resumes are personal uh, or professional, it's personnel marketing uh, devices that people use and the potential for, for puffery is, uh, is there. Um, the second one is called the land and expand. So you do kind of a similar thing. You get your top guy into the company, only him, and you have him do a great job at one or more projects and then you have him climb up the corporate hierarchy, gain trust, and when you do that, you, uh, you try to get, build some goodwill, and then you are in a position to start influencing the decision-making processes. So now every time it comes up, oh, we, we might need to build a new website because our website is two years old, uh, and there's a new thing that we need to, a uh, new technology, then uh, this guy can say, oh, well, we have actually the star team. We have the perfect team. And before you know it, you will find that consulting company is everywhere. 
with also junior devs, um, but it's a great way to get in and to uh, increase uh, the number of consultants with your client. And the talent, the guy who came in, he, get, he might get some reward scheme uh, back home. And also, uh, you have more political allies because you have more people from uh, your consulting company. And then there's the vendor lock-in. So when you're already in a company uh, with a client you, and you're nefarious, uh, then you want to make it as costly as possible to replace you. So um, in our circles, we have a saying that says to leave your code uh, as if the next person is a vengeful psychopath that has also knows your address. Um, but if you're nefarious, you don't want to do that. You want to create exclusivity. You want there to be not so much documentation. Um, you want maybe to uh, promote more novel uh, tools and technologies because that decreases the available pool that can replace you. Um, if you're really smart, then you're going to want to sell some in-house uh, software uh, into the client. So that means that uh, when you're the only one who can uh, help out with that software. No one else knows anything about this in-house tool. And also, it's probably, it can be some uh, old legacy software that you just sold, uh, so there's not a lot of maintenance on it. So when your client has a problem because the software doesn't run anymore, they're going to have to uh, uh, talk to you. And you, you'll say, oh, we can fix that bug for a price. So make it as costly as possible to replace you. And then when you're there, then you can start to inflate the cost of your personnel. Uh, maybe you want to minimize effort so you can double staff, uh, have them work uh, in a different, uh, with a different client as well. If there are any changes that, want, that needs to be made on the project, you make a variation order, like a change order. So everything uh, that needs to be done extra, you, you're going to have to get paid for that. Um, you can also, if there's a problem, you can always blame any issues on the client constantly changing the specifications all the time. Um, now, since we're talking about nefarious actors here, why don't we go one step further? We absorb the business and domain knowledge of the company. Uh, we're going to want to recruit the top talent, pay them a little bit better, and uh, if we're extra devious, we'll sell it back to them at a premium. Um, there's one funny phenomenon that I heard about that uh, I'd like to tell you about. It's called the CV-driven development. So that's when a consultant comes in and he wants to learn the coolest new shiny technology. So he proposes that as a solution. Because then he gets to learn how to, use, how to use this new technology on your bill. And you're left with maybe something beta stuff and uh, anyway, it was developed by someone who learned it the first time. So it's not necessarily a good deal for you. OK, so how, what can we do to mitigate these uh, risks that the agents are doing to us? So if you remember what I mentioned, the two things, the asymmet uh, information asymmetry and the incentive difference. So you want to decrease the information gap. You don't want to be a, uh, a project leader, a technical leader that has no idea about the technological stack. I've seen that uh, too many times that there's, uh, there's uh, technical management in-house that kind of have outsourced too much to the consultants. And that's not a good position to be in. You want to insist on full access to source repositories, uh, to any metrics. Uh, you want to own the source, source repositories, preferably. Uh, the build system, the task management system, it's good to have access to that stuff. Um, it's important to note that there's also a difference between information that you ga gather and also understanding that information. So information itself will not get you anywhere unless you understand what it means. Um, you might want to introduce a technical uh, review by a third party, a nonpartisan party that can come in and uh, at least then uh, there's no skin in the game for them to uh, uh, to cater to a bad solution. Um, so 
Just keep someone on your side that knows enough to judge whether this is a good way forward or a bad way forward. Um, that also puts accountability to, your, to a person that's your employer. So you don't want accountability to be uh, with the consulting company. You want to be part of the project. Um, you can also try to align these incentives so that you get more of the same interests. Uh, you want to maybe increase the number of interactions with a, with a consulting company. So don't just give them the whole project uh, at once, maybe. Just give them a project, uh, like a small part of the project, see how they do. That gives them an incentive to achieve a good solution for you. Um, split the project into parts, yeah. Um, you can also do a performance-based reward. Uh, that's getting more popular now, that the consulting company comes in and say, we can just get a cut of whatever success that you have, uh, and we don't have to get paid if you don't succeed. Um, it's interesting, but it also might end up costing you a lot if you have a lot of success. And also, it might not always be easy to, to find a way to uh, measure objectively the, the monetary success. Okay. Minimize dependency. Um, Minimize that sunk cost, that potential for sunk cost. You want to make it easy to replace. Um, avoid vendor lock-in at all costs. That's a, a very good uh, tip. Insist on using standard tools, code guidelines, um, proper documentation, well-known technologies. Um, you might want to consider m multiple contractors, so more than one, maybe two contractors. Uh, this, is, this is especially useful if you're dealing with more novel technology, innovative technology, or uh, like uh, niche languages, because then you always have one extra supplier. It also helps uh, to enforce these code guidelines, because then they will have to communicate with each other and share code. Um, one thing to remember is that us consultants, it's very easy for us to be yes man, can do people. Yes, we can do it. Um, one of the reasons for that is that if we are too critical, we might be dropped off the project. And it's much easier for us to just get by on fixing things for you and doing what you tell us to do. But if what you tell us, if you as a client tells us consultants to do something that we consultants might not agree with, then it might be, feel hard for us, uh, for some of us, to uh, take that d discussion because uh, things can very quickly turn political. If there's a consulting company that's nefarious and we come in, um, if I were to say, well, this solution is not very good, there's still a person in-house that got this consulting company in, in the first place, and he might want, not want to feel uh, attacked in that way. Uh, be aware of patchwork and band-aids uh, for things uh, instead of big rewrites. Um, that's something that uh, might happen. And in conclusion, uh, we went very quickly through um, a, a principal agent problem and how that might apply to software consulting in, uh, the software consulting industry. Um, we've seen what asymmetric information is and different interests and how it can create a risk of what's called moral hazard, which is the agent working uh, against your own interest. Uh, we discussed some possible techniques that are available for a nefarious actor and how to mitigate them. But I would like to leave you with uh, two important points, three important points. Um, remember that a consultant always works for two companies. They work for you as the client, and they also work for their employer. And most of us are very good at keeping a, a, a balanced attitude towards these two loyalties. But it's always a, a thing to remember, that we work for two companies. Um, the second one is, has to do with accountability again. So if you imagine your project is the Titanic, uh, then us consultants, uh, we are the first class, first class passengers. That means we always, uh, we're the ones that get the lifeboats when the ship starts sinking. Because we can go to a different project at a different client. And the solution itself that's not working will stay with you. So you might find yourself with a violin in your arms 
and uh, play as the ship goes down. Um, but most importantly, we are decent people. Most of us are. Um, and this uh, principal agent problem comes from economic theory. It comes from uh, game theory. Um, it excludes uh, sometimes, uh, it, it assumes that we're all acting in our best interest, economic interest. But it, it, it is also the case that if you motivate people and if you don't micromanage them, if you uh, keep them motivated, they will do a good job for you, most likely. So that's always uh, important to keep in mind. I don't want you to fi find uh, that you now are very too skeptical and are showing it too much. So just assume good intentions, uh, encourage mutual trust, and avoid micromanagement because uh, your consultant might go the extra mile for you. Uh, he might want to do it out of personal reasons, and he will probably put in that extra effort that is required sometimes. So in conclusion, do not get tricked by the worst among us and nurture and support the best among us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for this talk. We have time for questions. Sebastian, thank, thanks for your talk. Uh, I like your car repair uh, metaphor, okay? so. How would you project your mitigation structure uh, strategies in the car repair scenario? Uh, which scenario did you say? The scenario that my car has a funky light in the dashboard. Oh. I need to go there. Yeah, yeah. I'm the principal. Mm. The mechanic is the actor. So what kind of mitig how would you mm. project your mitigation strategies into that metaphor? Yeah. So what I would do then is that um, I would try to decrease the information gap. So part of that uh, information asymmetry is that I don't know if he's a good repairman or if he's trustworthy. So I could go to a review site and I would see, does he have good reviews? And that would help me to get information about other people's experience. Um, and I wish that there was something uh, similar uh, in terms of software consulting. I think that would be very helpful for everyone involved. But it's, uh, it's very difficult because then uh, you would need some objective metrics and uh, I don't think it would be uh, that easy to set up. Uh, I think most of the time, um, more major corporations as clients, they would have their internal registry uh, where they log their experiences. More questions? Please. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, as a role, as a Consultant, um, you talked about this information asymmetry and the, the agent and the, and the um, what was the P again? Principle. The principle. Mm. Um, and you also told us that there exist some technical leaders in companies that are a little bit um, far away from the tech experts uh, they need to lead. Do you encounter this, this principle and agent problem within companies and how do you deal with them when they are already existing and you um, yeah, join that? If I encounter this uh, in existing uh, companies... Or uh, does it exist? Uh, did yes, you have some, it, some experiences? I would say, yeah, I would say it does exist. Uh, I've encountered situations where there's a very, very bad situation and uh, somehow it needs to be dealt with. So it might be a bad technical solution that is only going to be viable for the minimum viable product and uh, it's not going to work for any real case scenario. Uh, the problem if, if, if the in-house leadership lacks the technical know-how uh, uh, specific to that domain is that if another uh, well-meaning consultant comes and says, look at this, this is not going to be going to work well, we need to do it this way and that way instead is what I propose. then. The, the management has a tough situation because he, he can't really um, do any value judgment whether or not uh, that well-meaning person is correct. So that makes it, it, turns it into almost like a trust issue. Who do I trust the most? Uh, and then sometimes the person who's been there for longer has uh, gained more trust. Uh, so I definitely find that to be a, 
uh, a difficult situation sometimes, and specifically for companies that don't have software as their main revenue generating uh, uh, area. All right, we're out of time. So thanks again, Sebastian, for this nice talk. And if you have further questions, uh, come up to him. Thank you. Thank you.